Good morning, church. Uh, my name is uh, Mark Sim. I'm one of the newest elders here. And as an elder, one of the privileges that we get to have is to share the Word of God with you on Sunday morning. And um, it's been a while for me, though. The last time I preached, I was telling, I was telling, um, <laughs> see, I'm already, <laughs> Wesley. <laughs> last time I preached was in college, and now I have a, a daughter who's going to be a third year in college. So it's been a minute, as the kids say. Um, so I encourage you, as the Bible does, to test whatever I share to see if it's right and true, all right? And then I'm also, I also teach here at Risen Junior, so hopefully I don't have to tell you guys to stay in your seats or <laughs> walk you through the bathrooms or anything like that, right? So this would be a, a, a different change for me. But why don't we pray and let's start. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much. Thank you so much for your word. You've given us so much. Uh, you've given us your son. You've given us yourself. You've given us the Holy Spirit as we learned in the last several weeks. Um, but you also gave us your word uh, that we can go into each and every day um, and to really read the, the words from you and to meditate and to study and to discuss and to share. And it's such an honor and privilege to do so. I just ask now that you um, allow me to just speak your word. It's not my words, but yours. And may the body here be receptive to your word. Uh, not just in our heads, but in our hearts. And may our lives be transformed. May our lives be encouraged. Our, may our lives be challenged by the words you share with us. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so uh, in the last few weeks, we've been going through um, the Holy Spirit, what it means to, uh, who the Holy Spirit is and what it means to us. And in the next several weeks, we are starting a new um, book. Um, we're going to go over the first, uh, book of First Timothy. And if you've been keeping up with our annual uh, Bible reading program, we're actually right on 1 Timothy, which is really cool, because then you guys should know everything that I'm speaking about today, and you guys can really keep me honest, right? So why don't we start by reading uh, 1 Timothy, uh, verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, and I'll go to verse 11. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father, and Christ Jesus, our Lord. As I urged you upon my departure for Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus, in order that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to the myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. For some men, straying from these things, have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand, either what they are saying or the matter about which they make confident assertions. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing that the fact that the law is not made for righteous man, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which, with which I have been entrusted. Amen. So let's start with this. Who is Timothy? Right? From this text alone, we know that Timothy was in Ephesus. We know that he is, by Paul, calls him a spiritual child in faith. Right? But to get a little bit more detail about him, I'm going to direct you to Acts chapter 16. Right? If you go to Acts chapter 16, starting from verse 1, it says, And he came also to Derbe and, uh, and to Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy. We meet Timothy here again. The son of the Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. And he, he was well spoken of by the, brethren who were, by the brethren who were there in Lystra and in Iconium. 
Paul wanted this man to go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts where they all knew that his father was a Greek. So we know a little bit more about Timothy. He was from mixed blood. His father was Greek. His mother, Eunice, his grandmother, Lois, were Jewish, right? And he grew up in a home of faith. So he was a faithful man. And the image that I have of Timothy, it's, it's really interesting because here's Paul, who was, everyone knows who Paul is, and Timothy, who is like the spiritual son, right? You all have almost this, uh, I imagine these two very different personalities, right? Paul is kind of like, I think I'd be scared of Paul if I, if I saw him, right? He's that type A, oh, that's the guy that stoned that guy to death, right? He's that type. And then you have Timothy, who seems a little bit more gentler, right? Uh, he was a person of faith. Uh, he was well-respected. He was well-loved. Uh, but he oftentimes got discouraged. I mean, Paul wrote two letters to him, right? <laughs> it's, it's a very different type of leaders, but they're both leaders of the early church, right? And in fact, Paul in Philippians chapter 2, verse 19 through 20 says this. This is in descrip- describing Timothy, right? I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare, for they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Two very different types of leaders, and yet Timothy genuinely cared for the church, right? And and it's really nice. I I saw Timothy earlier from our church, Timothy (laughs) Jang. back there. And um, one of the things I really love about him is he genuinely cares for the people of this church, right? And so that's kind of the image that I have of who Timothy is, right? And if you look at the book of 1 Timothy, it really is a good manual for how to operate a a church, a local church, right? It goes about like a lot of the qualifications of an elder. It's all in there. But Paul starts off the, the letter by saying what? What's the first thing that you need to be cautious of? Make sure that you are sound in your doctrine. Make sure that you're teaching the truth. And he talks about that in verses 3 through verses 7, right? And why is that so important, right? Why is sound doctrine so important? In the, during the 70s, right, some of you guys are young here. Maybe you guys heard about it in history. So I, I know Ellie did, my, my daughters, my kids. During, in 1978, there was a, a huge massacre called Jonestown Massacre, right? Some of you guys heard of it. Maybe some of you guys know it really well. Uh, but a, a preacher, actually, a Pentecostal preacher by the name of Jim Jones, um, started his ministry early 50s, 60s, right? And it started off good, right? And, and this is kind of enlightening, as I did more studies about him, I realized during 1950, June 25th, 1950 is when Korean War started, and 1953 is when it ended, Jim Jones actually adopted some of these kids, orphaned from Korea, right? So what he was preaching in the beginning was, hey, we should be kind, we should, there should be racial equality, there should be economic equality, right? All these things sound great, and then somewhere they deviated. Right? And what's the cost of false doctrine? In 1978, in Jonestown, 909 people perish. Two hundred and seventy, over two hundred and seventy were children. Right? That's a direct outcome of and a very tangible outcome and a tragic outcome of what poor teaching can do, right? But it's not just that. It had happened, the poor teaching, right? Poor doctrine occurred in Ephesus. It occurs now. And it occurred in the beginning of time, right? And why is it, why is poor doctrine, poor teaching so tempting for us? Why, why do we want to follow that, right? And, I, and I'm, I'm going to include poor doctrine not just as someone like Jim Jones Right, who skewed, obviously, the, the scripture and what it means. I'm going to include poor doctrine as anything or anyone that tells you that the answer to life is outside of this word, right? whether it's academics, whether it's social justice, 
whatever it may be that people are into, right? Anything that says anything outside of this is the truth and that'll make your life better is poor doctrine. And we saw that in Ephesus too, right? They had Greek gods that they worshipped, right? But why? Why do we as human beings, are we so captivated by that, right? And in order to find out, let's go all the way back to Genesis, right? Genesis chapter 3, the initial fall of man. And I'll read from here. <laughs> now, this is Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God has made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God said, you shall not eat from it or touch it lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, you shall surely not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from you, eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for, God, for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from it its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they, were, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. First bad doctrine, right? Recorded. First recorded bad doctrine. Why was it bad, right? Satan, first of all, before I go into why it's bad, I don't think Eve ate from the fruit, walked around for a little bit, you know, like, oh, I am better than Adam, I know, I know more than him, and then gave the fruit to Adam. I think they were there together. And the reason why I say they're there together is because if Eve ate the forbidden fruit, right, then he, she would have known that Adam was naked, right? And she would have probably ran and hid, right? But in Scripture it says, no, they're both ashamed, right? So it means they did it together. It's not Eve and then Adam. They were there together, right? And the poor doctrine is this. Number one, serpent says this, surely you shall not die, right? And the nerve of the serpent saying this is incredible, because what was the verse right before, right? Eve says, oh, if you eat it, or if you even touch it, you'll die. But the serpent goes, no, no, that's not true, right? Do you really think that Adam and Eve was that forgetful, right? I don't think, I don't think they were, right? But I think they exercise what we sometimes exercise, which is we conveniently forget, right? We know but we conveniently justify our forgetfulness, right? How does she justify it? The fruit looks good. It's desirable. Oh, and it'll make me wise. It'll make me better, right? So you start justifying, right? And then here's, the <laughs> you know, you don't commit murder. Like, you don't just walk out and just commit murder, right? There's a step. Right? Sin is progressive. Right? You, you start little, you take little steps. Maybe I'm angry at that person. Maybe I hold that anger one day. Maybe I hold that two days, three days. Right? And that's what she's doing, right? And, and God per created these protections and boundaries. So he didn't just say, don't eat it. Don't touch it. Don't even go there. Right? And what does she do? She touches it. She looks at it. She goes, oh, it's good. Oh, I already touched it. I'm already, I already disobey God, might as well just eat it. And we fall into those same type of behavior, right? And there's a warning here, right? There's a warning here, don't do that, right? Don't just say, because I messed up a little bit, I'm going to go all the way, right? Don't do that. And then the second lie, which is a little more subtle, is this. Because if you really read this scripture, right, did Satan really lie? Did the serpent lie? When she ate that fruit, did she not know the difference between good and evil? 
was she not a little bit more like God? That's all true. So Satan can go and say, look, you ate it. It happened. I told you it was going to happen, and you're fine, right? But the lie is this. But the lie is not that you'll know what the truth of good and evil is. The lie is that you are going to be like God, and being like God or an imitation of God is better than being with God. Hear that? Garden, Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve had everything. They had a perfect relationship with God. And Satan says, huh, you could be like God. And that's better than being with the real God. That's the lie. And that's the lie that bad doctrine really focuses on. And that's what it tempts us with, right? We being better, right? Whether it's I'm more faithful, right? Some of the, the, if you met anyone who was involved with the cult or bad religion, whatever it is, they're some of the most devout people, right? Because they feel good. The more they work, the more they do, someday I'm going to reach God, right? Someday I'm going to be closer to God, right? So it becomes you being an imitation of God is better than being with God. And that lie started in the garden, it was there in Ephesus during Timothy's time. But what were they talking about? Genealogies, things that didn't further the kingdom of God, right? I think it's interesting that actually Paul mentions genealogies because we learn that Timothy was half Greek, right? So what, what, what do you think was going on? These men were teaching about genealogies. Oh, wait, by the way, our leader in this church, he's half Greek. He's not Jewish. It's almost like a, like a stab at him, right? And Paul's encouraging Timothy, like, don't worry about that. Worry about preaching the truth, right? This self-promotion is so strong, right? Whether you know Christ or whether you, you don't, right? I mean, you see it in our world, right? Academics, science. We, are, we as human beings are better. We can better ourselves, right? But you know what the lie is and the trick is? The trick is you could only say that. You can only say that we would be better without God, right, by making God smaller, making that goal obtainable, right? If God, in reality, right, if we're here, God's all the way over there, right? God is so far from us. God is so holy. By diminishing that, by diminishing who he is, right, and saying you, us, as human beings, we're enlightened. We can get there on our own, right? Maybe if we pray harder, in your next slide, you'll come out as someone, I don't know, a better animal. You could be an eagle. You can be whatever, right? Maybe if you give more, maybe if you serve more, right? You'll be a better person, and someday you'll get there on your own, right? And that is a very powerful message, and it's because of this fall, right? Because Adam and Eve took that fruit of good, the knowledge of good and evil, right? Notice that fruit wasn't, if you take that fruit, you're going to become God. You'll be just like him and equal. The lie was subtle. You could be like God. You could just be a cheap imitation of God, but you'll never be God. Right? And the lie is, and that is better than being with the real God. That's a great lie. That's a lie that we haven't, that we still believe in. Right? And I think that's why the temptation for bad doctrine is always, always present. Paul goes on to Timothy and says, well, we know why. We know why we are tempted by lies. We know why we're tempted by bad doctrine. Because bad doctrine will tell you that you are the king. You are the center of your life. And you will be a little bit wiser. right? You will do better instead of tapping into what we already have. So what's the truth? I'm going to just kind of amuse me here for a sec. 
when you first become a Christian, right? You go, you know, you you understand, you hear the word, you hear the gospel, right? And you 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 start your life here. And let's say God's on the other side of that stage, right? So you 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 start reading the scripture, you start praying, you start doing everything that's right, and you and you realize you're getting closer to God, right? Maybe you've taken one or two steps closer to God, right? You feel great. You look up and you realize, wait, God's not at the end of the stage. He's not 20 paces away from me. God is actually maybe 50 paces. So you feel bad, right? You repent. You go, ah, I got to be a better Christian. And now you take, let's say, five more steps, right? And then you look up and you realize, wait, God wasn't 50 paces away. Where is God? Where is God in relation to you? That gap between you and God, you and God, the holy God, the God created, the God who created the universe, the God who created us, that gap is infinite. Right? It's not, it's not there. It's infinite. Infinite. I'm gonna get nerd out a little bit. So if I, my son loves the flash, right? He's like the fastest superhero ever, runs at the speed of light. If I'm flat and I'm running at the speed of light, when would I get to infinite separation? I'll never get there. I can run for eternity and I'll never get there, right? But who covers that gap? Who covers that gap? We all know the answer. <laughs> Jesus, right? So when we say God's love for us is great, really underselling it, right? God's love is infinite. That grace that covers that gap between us, the sinner, and God, the holy God, that separate, that, that gap is covered by Jesus' blood. And not only did Jesus cover that blood because he loved us, no other sacrifice could cover that gap. None, right? He had to die for us. He had to die and defeat sin because who's going to cover an infinite amount of gap? Nothing in this world, right? Nothing. So now you think about this. We're living our life, right? And what else does he give us? He gives the holy gods over there infinitely away. How big is Christ, right, in our, in our lives? To cover that. Not only that, in the last four weeks, what do we learn? God gives us the Holy Spirit to dwell in us, to live inside of us, to help us experience all of that. Right? Guys, this is the greatest story ever. Right? Ever told. Right? Think how grand that is. Think how great that is. The separation of me and God is something that should be savored because that makes God so big. He's not obtainable. I can't walk over there. I can't run there. I can't travel at the speed of light and get there. God is, this story, there's no other religion that actually tells you that story. None. Everyone will say, work harder and you'll someday, work hard and you'll get there. It's like my parents, work hard and you'll get there. <laughs> right? No. God says, this is all yours. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Right? All three for us. And what do we do with our lives? <laughs> we stand here, right, and walking our Christian life. We look to our right. We look to our left. We see other people. We're like, ah, oh, I'm kind of better than that person. Right? You start comparing our lives, right? Well, maybe I could be like God. And you start comparing our lives, right? I tell my kids, don't ever compare yourself to other people, because there's no good that comes out of it, right? There's two outcomes, logically. You're either going to feel envy, because, oh, that person is better than me, right? Or you're going to feel pride, because I am better than that person, right? Either outcome's no good, right? Don't do that. And then I'll take it a step further. Don't compare yourself to your past self or your future self. And I, let me kind of explain that a little bit more. Your past self, you can look back on your youth, and you go, wow, I have a lot of regrets for some of the things I've done. 
or wow, I was really, I mean, I can play basketball all day, next day I won't hurt, I envy my younger self, <laughs> right? We can envy our younger self, right? Or we can have regrets of our younger self. When you look at our future self, right, we can become very obsessed. I want to get there. That's going to be me. That's, that's me. You get obsessed or you get depressed because <laughs> you're like, ooh, I thought I was going to be a lot closer to where I thought I was going to be, right? None of that's good. So we're standing in our own little world, right, like Adam and Eve, and saying, oh, I'm like God, and I kind of know good and evil. Like the, the men who kind of said they understood the law, and they're kind of talking about the law, but they don't know what the law is supposed to be. The law is a mirror, right? It's a mirror to our soul. And we look at this, and we're not saying, hey, I know better than you, I know better than you. You should look at the law. That's not what it is. It's a mirror to our soul so that we can see the holiness of God and how much we need him, right? That's what they were missing back then. And it's really interesting. You know, when you, when you get a proper perspective of the gospel, you really realize why that thief on the cross and Paul, Apostle Paul, both of them were separated from the holiness of God by how much? infinite amount, right? It's the same, right? It doesn't matter if I'm five or ten steps ahead of you. The separation is still infinite, right? And that's why whether you are a thief on the cross, whether you're Paul or anyone in between, we're all the same, right? And it's nothing that we do, right? Nothing that we do that's going to draw us closer to him, right? Everything that we do is going to reveal to us who he is, how much we need Christ, how much we need to rely on the Holy Spirit. All those things are not of our own efforts. Our only effort is to obey. Right? What does scripture say? Better to obey than to sacrifice. Right? It's nothing that we do. Right? And, and, to, and to rob of that joy, right? To that, I mean, think about Think about what you guys have. If you're a believer today, this story is not new. All of us have experienced this story to a certain degree, right? Some of us experienced it when we were younger. Some of you guys experienced it maybe this week, right? But to see the, the grandness of who God is and, and the beauty of that complexity story, right? He gave us all three of him, right? The holy God, the grace of Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Any religion, I challenge anybody, any religion, can they come and say that? They'll just say, you're going to be a better person. You're going to be better. It's you. But Christ says, no. It's about me, me, and me in your life. That's the completeness of that story. And that's the beauty of that story, right? So if you believe, if you even tasted that part in your life, if you have met God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit in that way, be excited. Be joyous. Be joyous. Because no matter what our life is, whatever our circumstances in this world if we focus like Adam and Eve and say, I'm going to be like God and just be the, the master of my own life, right? and just focus on this, look how much you're missing out on. Look how much you're missing out on. Right? That's not what God has planned for you, right? to be self-absorbed in your own little world. Listen to what God has done for you. Listen and obey and hang on for dear life. Because God's going to take you to places where, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be, like, financially successful. It doesn't mean that you're going to be greatly revered in this world. None of that. But you know what you'll have? You'll be connected to the eternal God. Right? And that's better than anything our little, <laughs> anything better than this little life can give us, Right?
And if you don't know Christ, if you're sitting here or you're listening or whatever and you don't know Christ, you are missing out. You are missing out. Hey, you, know, you can still eat hot dogs with this or whatever, but you can, you're missing out on what it means to have true joy. All right, we're singing that hymn all as well. Why? Why is all as well? Right? He lost his whole family. Why is it well? Because he knew it's beyond this. Right? Our life has hope. It has meaning. It has purpose. It has power. Right? How could it not? We're plugged into God the Father. Right? Sorry. Um. <laughs> this word helps us to understand a little bit of that. Cognitively, we understand. Right? The Holy Spirit helps us to experience that and feel that. Many, many men and women in history and now know and understand the truth of this message. This is not a new message. It's a message that's thousands of years old with millions of people probably hearing it. If you don't know what Christ has done for you, I plead with you to think, meditate, Read, ask people, because you're missing out on the greatest story. Greatest because it's true, right? You're missing out. And, and I think as we celebrate Independence Day, the title of my sermon was Dependence on Independence Day. And I want to end with this because um, it kind of summarizes what I've just shared with you, right? This is in Philippians chapter 3. I'll read it for you. And just listen to the words. It's powerful, you guys. Paul writes, More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them all but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. You see? To live is Christ and to die is gain, right? It may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. Remember in Timothy, the, 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 the economy there, right? In Timothy, what were the poor, the bad doctrine? What were they saying? They're using the law for their own, own benefit, right? But what is... Paul say here, from the law, right? You know who you are in relation to who God is. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it, or have already become perfect. That's all of us, right? Very relatable. But I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind me and reaching forward for what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. Let's pray.
Let's pray. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. Um, I don't think my, I went too long, so um, I'm gonna invite some people, if you want, to pray. I mean, we're a body here, right? We're a family. We can, we can celebrate together. And we can pray together. Um, I want to just kind of lead you guys in prayer, and I want whatever the Spirit is urging you to do, right? Pray. Let's pray together. So feel free to pray out loud, and I'll close this in prayer. We'll spend some time doing that. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being a great God. I thank you so much for being a God who is holy, holiness that we don't understand. We get a glimpse of it. We get a taste of it. But you're so big and you're so grand. And I thank you, in fact, that the gap between me and you is infinite. That you are not like me. 
And I thank you for your truth. And I thank you for your grace that allows us to be near you, that allows us to just cling to you. And what a joy it is to cling to you, look to you, and ask you, where do you want us to go? What do you want us to do? How do you want us to be? Lord, we'll continue to strive, but not because we want to make ourselves better, but because we just want to obey you. We want to please you. I pray for our church. I pray for the future of our church. I pray for the members here. I pray for the attendees. I pray for those that don't know you. I pray for those that do know you. No matter where we're at, you're the same. You're holy. Your grace is perfect. And your Holy Spirit is powerful. And may we meditate on that this weekend especially. It's Independence Weekend. I love that we are dependent on you because you are so much better than the imitation that we in this world try to create. Thank you again, Lord, for allowing me to share your word, your gospel. And may that, and I really do pray for those that don't know, help them to reach out to those that do. May we celebrate in the grandness of who you are. We love you. 